Welcome to the eLaborate Topics Podcast, where we focus on lab-specific strategies for medical laboratory professionals. We're proud to be the healthcare detectives that work behind the scenes to get the results needed to influence medical decisions. Let's grow together and jump right into the lab. Hi, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the eLaborate Topics Podcast. I'm your host for today's show, Stephanie Whitehead. For those of you tuning in for the first time, I'm your podcasting laboratory leader and co-host for this weekly podcast. Our Elaborate Topics podcast is a show where myself and my co-host, Taiwana Wilson and Lona Small, bring you topics related to the laboratory and leadership to help you excel inside and outside of the lab. And I have a very exciting guest on today's show, so let's get right into it. Today, I'm joined by, in my opinion, one of the most gifted voices in the laboratory medicine profession, Dr. Rodney Rohde. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to join you on Elaborate. I love what you're doing and, uh, and our other colleagues as well. So, as you know, uh, we need to get our voices and our, and our uh, written and verbal communication out there about what we do. So thank you for all that you do for the profession. No problem. And Dr. Rohde and I are actually uh, living in neighboring cities in Tex Texas. So uh, howdy neighbor. <laughs> yes, ma'am. From San Marvelous to San Antonio. So we're, yeah. we're ready to go. I'm going to let Dr. Rohde tell the listeners about himself, but before he does, I, does, I want to give you guys a little bit of highlights about his background, his bio. Dr. Rohde, like I said, in my opinion, is extremely gifted um, professional in our laboratory medicine um, area. Um, a couple of highlights was he was on the pathologist power list for 2020. He is on the Cardinal Health Laboratory Excellence List for 2022. And he was the number one quoted Texas state and public health subject matter ex expert during the COVID-19 pandemic and also other disasters like Hurricane Harvey. I think I heard a couple of talks from you. So, uh, Dr. Rohde, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for those highlights. Again, as I often tell people, um, just a little snippet about myself so that they might understand where I'm coming from. I I'm really a, a hybrid professional. And by that, I mean, when I started my uh, academic journey way back in the dark ages of 1985 is when I started my undergraduate career. I took a microbiology course and absolutely fell in love with infectious diseases. And I really didn't know anything about the medical laboratory as a profession. I really didn't. Uh, I just loved medical microbiology. I loved research. Uh, I got my master's degree in virology uh, right after my bachelor's. So I did seven years, two degrees and, and, and left thinking I could go work in a hospital. And as the story goes, no one would hire me, <laughs> uh, even with two degrees and a published master's thesis on polio virus. They just, you know, I didn't have the credential, as you're well aware of, Stephanie. So I was rudely uh, awakened to our profession by not being able to get a job in a hospital, jumped into the public health arena, which would hire me uh, with that background and and have loved that path. Um, certainly looking backwards, I probably would have went through an MLS program first, but it worked out. Uh, went to work for the Department of Health in Austin in the Bureau of Laboratories, and it gave me this wonderful foundation of working first in newborn screens, which helped me to learn about this profession because I started seeing name tags with uh, med techs and MLSs and was like, who are you? you know, what's that credential? So that's where I first learned about it in 1992, then um, jumped quickly into virus isolation and zoonotic uh, zoonosis control, where I worked in rabies, hantavirus, plague, uh, just about anything you could think of in the world of, of zoonotic disease. Loved that for a decade, did a couple of stints at CDC as a visiting scientist, and, and we could talk about rabies maybe at another time. It's a big part of my life for the first decade, did a lot of in, just amazing international work. Then uh, I, I was teaching as an adjunct at Austin Community College, uh, microbiology for nursing and other allied health majors, and really, really found myself enjoying it. Never in my life thought I would be a professor because I loved the bench, but the more I did it, uh, the more I loved it. And lo and behold, in 02, I had an opportunity to come back to Texas State, my alma mater, and jumped into the very program I didn't know existed, the clinical lab science program, because they needed a faculty member in uh, with an expertise in infectious diseases and micro. 
and picked up my specialty. So I should mention that. So that's I became a specialist in micro and virology, which doesn't exist anymore through ASCP and molecular biology. So that's those are my credentials. And quickly, as you know, have been in academia now, which has flown by 20 years, wow. uh, kind of advancing up through the ranks. And I'm currently the chair of clinical lab science and a regents professor. And and as you know, just love everything about my research specializations, but also advocating for our profession. It's mm -hmm. it's at the top of my of things to do. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for having me on. So uh, one, I want to say you you listeners heard it. He has obligated himself to come back for a second time and talk about rabies. So I'm going to hold him to that. <laughs> Absolutely. We I've can do that whenever got, you want. I've got a sequel. But you've named so many hats that you wear, you know, mentor, advocate, speaker, professor, um, you know, public health specialist. What is your favorite or is there a favorite? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I don't think I've ever been asked that. That's a great question. I, I love so many things. You know, I I do. I, I would I'd probably have to rank them kind of one and one A. I mean, I love everything about my medical laboratory advocacy and the realm of education and mentor. Mm -hmm. That's probably the top. But I mean, right there beside it is public health mm -hmm. activity and research, because for me uh, in my career journey, they are intertwined and integrated. Mm -hmm. And I almost on purpose, I, I purposefully tried to integrate things that I think students that I teach should be aware of. We need more researchers in the medical laboratory. We need people that are publishing and obtaining grants to do things that we need to learn about. So sometimes we forget that, I think, and it's understandable. You know, we're in the, most of us are in the clinical lab and we're putting out fires every single day and we may not have time to think about research, but we're kind of doing it. We're right. validating right. protocols. We're we're correlating things. I mean, that's part of the quantitative world of research. So I try to get students and colleagues, for that matter, to think about ways to maybe publish some things that they're doing, so that people learn about us. We are scientists, at, at the as the title stands. Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways to be visible, um, and we need to talk more about those different ways to put ourselves out there. So today is an Ask the Expert episode uh, regarding antimicrobial resistance, questions from a non-micro technologist. If you listen to this podcast, you know my background is blood bank, but I do have a public health uh, degree. Um, but I, I did want to bring Dr. Rodi on as an Ask the Expert, um, because while the world was preoccupied with the SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 pandemic, public health researchers warned that the antimicrobial resistance is another pandemic lurking in healthcare shadows. So Dr. Rohde, you recently co-authored an explainer article for the infection control tips, which is titled Antimicrobial Resistance, a Review of a Broad Spectrum Problem and Future Needs. Can you tell the listeners about AMR and give us some of the highlights of that article you just published? Sure, thank you. Uh, I often talk about antimicrobial resistance and or antibiotic resistance, um, which is kind of a, a, a subset of the bigger problem in terms of a hidden pandemic. I mean, we've been we've been talking about this for decades, really, and uh, it kind of a slow burning pandemic, but it's picked up some speed. Some of those embers, if you will, have jumped out into, um, you know, a more fanning the flames of more issues. And the pandemic certainly is part of that problem because as you mentioned, uh, if you think about it, Stephanie, for, from a physician standpoint, what's the one problem at the beginning of the pandemic that happened? Massive pneumonia, mm -hmm. you know, uh, massive issues of, you know, is this before testing was available? Is this SARS or is this bacterial pneumonia or is it something else? And so a lot of empirical antibiotic use was distributed sometimes multiple antibiotics trying to cover the cover the broad, broad spectrum of pneumonia-like agents. And that certainly has led to an increase. Uh, the data is showing it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of publications. You mentioned the explainer article I wrote. Thank you for bringing that to the, to the topic today. I and several colleagues, I had another specialist in microbiology, Andrea Prinzi, who you may know, Dr. Prinzi is amazing. Mm -hmm. And two pharmacists, I, I found working with PharmDs in the world of antimicrobial resistance and, and stewardship, 
uh, are critical, just like physicians are. So anyway, because of this empirical use um, around SARS-CoV patients, we have seen an increase in uh, antimicrobial resistance. And the article that I talk about this, we really kind of used as an opportunity to do kind of a big broad review. Uh, and, you know, there was a, a recent publication in Lancet uh, that's really a systemic analysis of this problem from about 204 countries, and it's a 2022 publication. So again, I encourage you to read that primary article if you're interested, as well as a WHO, a World Health Organization uh, Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance System. It's called GLASS, the GLASS report. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of scary uh, and what they found when they looked at those reviews is that there's been an estimated almost 5 million deaths associated with infections caused by antibiotic resistant organisms since 2019. As you might expect, most of these are from uh, lower middle income countries uh, and the six leading pathogens are in, in order E. coli, Staph aureus, Flebsiella pneumonia, Strep pneumonia, Acinobacter bomini, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And so without getting you know, deep into the details, the article really highlights those two publications. And then we start bringing in other articles, uh, primary articles about um, issues around technology. For example, Stephanie, uh, as a laboratorian, one of the big issues is this idea of empirical prescribing, right? So, you know, what, what can you do? As a, as a medical lab scientist, one of the things you can do is work with your pharmacist and your physicians to highlight how critical uh, susceptibility testing is, right? So there's one thing you're always needing to identify the microorganism first, that's primary, <clears throat> but right there next to it is susceptibility testing if time allows it and it really, you really want to if you can, so that you can identify the most potent narrow spectrum antibiotics that you can use instead of just always throwing uh, broad spectrum antibiotics at, um, at an infection that you may not know about. Even knowing that it's bacterial versus viral is important because if you know it's viral, then you kind of change your mindset on the treatment of, okay, antibiotics aren't going to be helpful. Let's start thinking of antivirals and so forth. So um, that's part of it. Um, another part of the article focuses on, and Dr. Prinzi does a great job on this, talking about uh, clinical breakpoints and how many laboratories around the U.S. are using old breakpoints. Uh, they're not staying current, and it's a complicated thing. So she's she's done a nice uh, article she writ, wrote in uh, ASM. Her and I are contributing articles for ASM, and just a wonderful explainer article for the bench level technologist to kind of think about how you use clinical breakpoints. Uh, and that gets again into more detailed um, discussion, but you know, some of the things you can think about as a bench level uh, MLS or MLT or otherwise. And then just the bigger, bigger picture that may be something we can talk about, which is that one health uh, focus around kind of the public health of this. So. If you didn't know this, um, all predictive modeling shows that if we don't do do some things globally, that AMR, antimicrobial resistance, will approach uh, 10 million deaths annually by 2050, and probably 100 trillion with a T in economic impact by 2050. And if that happens, Stephanie, um, AMR infections and, and mortality will surpass cancer as the number one uh, killer. That's never happened before. Um, and so not to be an alarmist, because <laughs> we've had a lot of that through the pandemic, uh, but we do need to take it seriously because we're talking about situations that are already occurring, kind of normal infections with things like MRSA or, uh, or Klebsiella resistant uh, types of infections that basically will not respond to almost any antibiotics that we have on our shelves right now. So the idea that we're going backwards, mm -hmm. right? my grandmother lived to be almost a hundred. She's no longer wow. with us, but she used to talk to me about growing up 
Um, I mean, this is pre-antibiotic. She was born in the 1900s, early 1900s. And so she, she had uh, friends and siblings, and she even had her own, some of her own children uh, who succumb to things like scratch knees mm -hmm. or, or during childbirth, you know, when there were no antibiotics. Uh, so we've taken them for granted, again, as a country, especially in America, we're very spoiled mm -hmm. uh, on our use of antimicrobials and how, you know, a pill is going to fix it. Not forever, <laughs> not forever. So that's, I'll stop there and see if you have any probing questions about that article you want to ask me. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned, you know, just the global threat. It's not just here in our country. It's the global, you know, um, threat, public health threat of AMR. And so I think one of the things that was so difficult when SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic arose was just the infrastructure wasn't there. We just weren't right. prepared for something like that to hit um, our entire world so drastically. And so I wonder for you, Sometimes, you know, working in the healthcare environment, it's sad, but I tell people you kind of get, you know, numb to things. Yes. Um, yes. Some things just become very normal. Um, you know, when you're when you're working in the laboratory on the news, it can seem alarming to see, you know, so many people in the morgue that you need refrigerated trucks outside. But in the laboratory, it's, you know, these are these are decedents that we need to respectfully, you know, deal with in the, in the way that we have our procedures to deal with. And so sometimes you can get kind of numb because this is our normal life. I wonder for you, because you've done so much study and so, so much work in this subject, what actually scares you about AMR, but also what fascinates you about this um, topic? Yeah, great point. Um, let me give you my numbing of this topic. Um, I remember when I first came to Texas State, I came here in 2002, and I kind of transitioned from wet lab research on rabies because we couldn't do that here. We didn't have the um, facilities at the time. And I started working with MRSA, which everyone probably out there knows is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And it was kind of a new thing in the early 2000s. We were seeing it primarily in, I, I, the old term was community acquired. So in prisons, mm -hmm. um, long-term care institutes, and then we would kind of designate healthcare acquired, H-A-M-R-S-A. There's really no lines anymore. It's everywhere. And I can remember my students, when I first started doing clinicals with them, they would be like, oh man, we had a MRSA isolate today. Now? You know, and they would quarantine and they would, you know, raise the flags in the hospital. Now it's, and you know this, right? It's, it's every day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 30, 40, 50% prevalence rates of MRSA. So yes, you are absolutely right. And that's probably part of what we need to work on is not becoming numb uh, to the issue. You can use the pandemic uh, as an example again, right? I mean, I, I just mentioned this yesterday on a Facebook post that, I haven't posted in a while about COVID, and I'm sure all of you are glad <laughs> because that's all I was doing. Um, because as as I mentioned, you know, the virus is not done with us. Mm -hmm. We're certainly in better times. We have vaccines. We have anti, you know, anti uh, monoclonal antibodies, antivirals, but the virus isn't done with us, even though we may be done with it. Mm -hmm. So in our minds, sometimes we're just done with it. We're sick of it. We're tired of reading about it. We feel we feel uh, helpless, maybe, in what we can do. But you can't you can't stay there. You have to keep working. You have to keep chipping away at it. And AMR is just like that. It is going to not go away with any miracle vaccine overnight. It's going to be hard work and stewardship and things like that. So what frightens me? That that's what frightens me. What you just brought up, kind of this global, you know, throwing our hands up and saying, "Well, you know, it's not going to be my problem. I'll probably be dead and gone before it really gets bad." You know, that that worries me because I have children and I have you know lots of students and other young people. I it's going to be you know something that I think looking backward could surpass you know this pandemic or other pandemics because it's so difficult to address. It's just so global. Um, there are things that we have already brought up that are in the paper. You know, um, I often tell people that, 
and this is kind of a public health stance, it's a model that CDC and WHO talk about, but to introduce it to your audience, animal health plus environmental health plus human health equals one health, mm -hmm. right? So there's these three legs of the stool uh, that we really have to watch. And, and I'm sure you know about this, but sometimes people forget that animals are fed massive amounts of antibiotics to help keep animal health and produce better things for us. So that's true, huh? It is true. Oh. But chickens, I mean, if you've ever seen, um, and again, I'm not slamming the industry, mm -hmm. but they have to be cognizant and we have to work with them about the judicious use because some of it's needed, right? We need healthy animals and things like that, but we just don't want to pour it out there mm -hmm. uh, without any thought because so th this is where it enters the environment. The animals take it in, they're shedding fecal and, and urine substances that have these antibiotics to some level into the watershed. And so water has been shown to be a rapid amplifier of AMR pathogens around the world. Mm -hmm. Again, if you dig into some of the studies that I bring up and others that my co-authors bring up in this paper, you know, it might frighten you a little bit. Uh, even microplastics that people don't think about. Uh, microplastics are these little shavings of plastic from water bottles and everything else we use in our society that have become little um, niches for biofilm types of agents like Pseudomonas and others. And they, they amplify the ability to transfer genetic genes. And by that, what I mean is you just give them an opportunity. You have more pathogens living on these microplastics and they're able to become, they call them amplifiers, bio magnifiers of bugs that have resistance genes. So instead of it happening kind of normally over time, we're helping it to, to um, jump. Mm -hmm really quickly uh, into different species of bacteria. So it, it is a complex issue. It makes you want to throw up your hands and say, well, I, what can I do? Um, well, part of it's advocacy and awareness and trying to get society to understand these really deep seated issues, as well as, you know, you can simply do things that are better for society, mm -hmm. right? Quit, quit begging for antibiotics every time you have a sniffle, right? I mean, make sure it's a laboratory confirmed bacterial infection that's been susceptibility tested that needs an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. You don't need them for allergies. You don't need them for viral infections. You don't need them for, you know, whatever the situation is, unless it's been laboratory identified. So I, I talk about that a lot in my work um, in this area, just to get people aware. Uh, I've done a ton of stuff, uh, even with a TEDx talk where I Two take home lessons that I can tell the public that know nothing about microbiology or the lab. If you have an infection, make sure it is laboratory confirmed, identified, and two, ask about susceptibility testing. Make sure you're getting the right antibiotic. And anyone can do that. Mm -hmm. um, anyone mm -hmm. uh, can demand that type of test. That's great advice for our listeners. So I, um, I'm going to ask you an interesting question because you brought up the, the pharmaceutical side of it. So just in your opinion, um, because you have worked with so many people who are in this space, um, I would imagine that pharmacies or pharmaceutical companies wouldn't make as much money off of antibiotics as they would other drugs because they're fairly cheap to manufacture. And typically you only take them for a short amount of time, seven to 10 days. So why wouldn't pharmaceutical companies focus their efforts on things that are taking more um, long-term, like blood pressure medication or diabetes medication? Um, why would why would there be a push behind antibiotics if we know all of this with, with AMR? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I'm certainly not a pharmaceutical expert, so let me just preface my thoughts and opinions that I'm not a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. But I do work with some amazing uh for if you don't have any id forms on your on your healthcare uh outlook make sure you think about it or at least ask mm -hmm. again so another kind of tidbit i tell patients is ask for a strong infectious disease pharmacist uh, if you're having issues because they're really a good part of your team right of the industry you know I, that's a big question i'm not sure you know if it's because um 
you know, there's economic drivers uh, for both, uh, both long term things like blood pressure, uh, diabetes, you know, all of these different issues we deal with in our society that maybe that doesn't bring the money immediately mm-hmm. is things like antivirals and vaccines and antibiotics. It's got to be there, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're honest, it's got to be an economic issue. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure why. I do I do know, though, in talking with many of my colleagues who are passionate about stewardship in the pharmacy area, that they certainly um don't necessarily always want companies to be making new antibiotics that that's kind of the immediate response is well we need more antibiotics in the pipeline Mm -hmm. Uh, well maybe we need to focus our efforts on prevention uh, and slowing down acquisition of infection and you know overuse and misuse of antibiotics Mm -hmm. if everyone out there is honest and i've been there too when you're hurting um, you want something to fix it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, I mean, a total, total open book on this. I've had parents and, and family tell me, you know, that, you know, just in talking with them, well, I, you know, I, I just asked, you know, I felt like I needed an antibiotic because this was going on or that was going on. And sometimes they get it right. And in my brain, I'm just all kinds of alarms are going off. Like, cause personally, I want them to feel better. Mm-hmm. But professionally, I'm thinking, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Did you ask for a a lab test or did anybody run anything on you? Are you just dealing with cedar fever, you know, an allergy, which happens a lot in our state? Yeah. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but it is a huge problem um, with, you know, how much money we're pouring into to creating new antibiotics that may not last more than a few years to, because of resistance versus let's get to the heart of the problem, which is protecting the ones we already have. Yeah. Well, you mentioned some really great tips for listeners that they can share with their friends and their family um, to try to assist with this issue just from like a community standpoint. But I'm wondering um, for all of the laboratory professionals that are listening, especially the ones like like me that are not microbiology scientists, not clinical microbiologists, um, how can we advocate for this topic? You know, we work in the lab, we work in this space, this is our profession. How can we support um, this topic and help add, add this to our advocacy list of things. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. Let me give you some specific things you can do, uh, whether you're interested in it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing you can do is if you are interested in uh, microbiology, infectious disease, this type of talk, most hospitals or at least the healthcare system you work at have infection control committees. Mm-hmm. Um, I would I would certainly hope as a MLS or other or other medical laboratory professional, any level, uh, if you're having an interest in this, volunteer to be on those committees because you're going to sit across the table with physicians, nurses, uh, IPs, infection preventionists, uh, and and the healthcare team pharmacist to address. Uh, stewardship and resistance issues it's a great area to learn about it and and give um, your expertise from the laboratory standpoint testing susceptibility testing things like that really critical that's where you can really start working with pharmacy and physicians Uh, and again i I say that because it can really helps us in two ways stephanie it helps the problem of a and more but it's it also puts a face and a voice on the medical lab Uh, if you're willing to you know, share that expertise with these other healthcare professionals. It really helps our profession. Um, it, it really does. Um, we all have an opportunity to do that. The other, the other piece is, is that there are these um, other slants in the healthcare industry. I've got multiple alumni now that have gone this route. I don't want everyone leaving the lab, so don't take it that way. But infection preventionist are usually nurses Mm -hmm. but we can be those uh it's you can obtain a certification called a cic certification in infection control it's through apic the association of professionals in infection control and you can sit for that exam just like our exam you're you're already qualified basically bachelor's degree in this area qualifies you with some experience in the healthcare setting so once you get that documented 
you can, um, I was going to turn around and grab my book here. I have the actual review book for this. So I've had several alumni that um, just like when you're preparing for your certification, you study for a while. You might have to dig in a little bit on the area of hospital epidemiology around infections and patient interactions, kind of the areas we're not strong in, and then sit for that exam. And then you get to add CIC uh, behind your, uh, your MPH and your MLS or whatever else you have, and now you can be an IP. Um, what better IP than a medical laboratory professional? We know microbiology usually. So really, those, those two things. The other kind of bigger thing, if you're really into it, is looking at ASCP, ASCLS, ASM, uh, even things like APIC and, and Infectious Disease Society of America. There's more big professional organizations out there. Even the Choosing Wisely campaign, right? Thinking about what what can we do? What can we offer healthcare from our laboratory background that will help solve problems around identifying infections and creating susceptibility profiles, you know, knowing our clinical breakpoints? You can literally inform physicians and others about actual testing that's critical. Okay. So those are kind of the big three, I guess. That is, you know, I, I did some infection control previously in my career. And like you said, it was it was a great um, experience for me. And I ended up being a great resource to my uh, colleagues that were also IPs because they were nurses and they were approaching their surveillance and they were approaching, right. you know, their uh, rounds, the infection control rounds from the viewpoint of a, of a nurse. And so I was That's there right. approaching it from the viewpoint of a, of a laboratorian. Um, and I That's was actually right. able to find other things in our rounds. <laughs> that... Yeah. You know, it's, I really appreciate that you did that because um, going all the way back to when I, I'm still an adjunct professor at Austin Community College, mm -hmm. and people often ask me, why do you still do that? You have so many hats, and, and right. they're right, but one of the reasons I do it is because when I teach microbiology at the sophomore level, it's kind of the pre-micro for allied health. Mm -hmm. I get to teach nurses. Mm -hmm. uh, I get to teach respiratory therapists and medical lab future, all of them future professionals, and I plant that seed early that IP uh, is not just a nursing career path. Um, there are, you know, and I often do it in the in the language of don't do it right away. Go work in the lab for five or ten years and learn uh, as much as you can about microbiology. Then, you know, you might consider that as a career path that's you know really uh, progressive and really is something you're interested in. So, as you know, our our degree is foundational uh, to doing so many things that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can really lend our expertise in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. Different question, but it sounds like you interact with so many people who have a laboratory background and then so many students and then sounds like some community um, education as well. What do you tell people about antibacterial wipes and uh, hand, and hand sanitizer as an alternative to hand washing? Just curious. Yeah, great, great question. Um, I get that a lot. Uh, <laughs> but, and maybe you know that. I mean, it's... Um, it's interesting because um, I get it. Let me let me kind of put it in these terms. I get it from the lay public often, mm -hmm. and colleagues for that matter, that will say things like, "I'm sure you've heard this, especially during the pandemic." Oh, you know, I don't know. We're doing too much. Mm -hmm. uh, we're sanitizing and disinfecting and sterilizing. Children should just be allowed to play with X. They should swim in ponds. They should let dogs lick them in the mouth. They should X, 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 right? Okay, you know, I grew up that way. I, you know, I understand that mindset. It's, it's happening right now with the formula, mm -hmm. a crisis in our country. People are saying things like, oh, you know, when my grandmother raised me, they just fed me milk from X or, and, and not breastfeeding, but just whatever, you know, they would do this. And I, you know what? I get that. That was 100 years ago or 75 years ago. But a baby, especially a newborn mm -hmm. and a tiny infant, has very little immune system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are taking an absolute risk mm -hmm. if you do those things. So I understand it. There is this need to have exposure to society and, and microbial exposure so we de develop immunity over our lifetime. But as I've said many times during the pandemic, that does not mean I support it when it's a novel 
or unknown agent, mm -hmm. right? I mean, SARS-CoV-2 was killing people left and right. We just passed a million dead in this country, and that's an underestimation. I mean, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. Right. And in general, people shouldn't live their lives in fear. Mm -hmm. um, but when it makes sense from a scientific viewpoint, there's an absolute place for disinfection and cleaning. Uh, I wouldn't overuse hand wipes on a on a daily basis or anything. But if I was on a plane or a subway or I went into a place where there was lots of people I didn't know, I'm probably going to be a little more careful with hand hygiene, especially if I'm shaking hands or, mm -hmm. you know, touching surfaces that I'm not familiar with. In my daily life at home, no, right? I mean, it's just common sense. I'm going to interact with my family and my loved ones and friends that I'm with all the time. I'm not going to wipe down everything every day. But it's different when you're in a healthcare setting right. or in a long-term care setting when you have immunocompromised grandmothers and grandfathers and others that you can't treat them the same way. So part of it's an education piece that I continually talk about with people because I'll just I'll, I'll push right back when they bring that up and like I understand what you're saying, but a nursing home is different. So yeah, you may not want to wear your mask, you may not want to wash your hands, you may not want to do this, but if you're going to see my grandmother, that's true. You will. That's good. That's good. <laughs> because you can't guarantee me that uh, you're not harboring some some flora that's even normal to you that might kill her. So. Again, it's an education piece. Some people, you have to kind of keep pushing it because they just, they're not aware of how we are vectors every day. Uh, these, you know, these hands that I'm holding up uh, can be problems right. if you are not careful, right? Just hand washing, just common sense. So, yeah, yeah so I, I think, you know, I don't want the world to overdo it. And we, maybe we have, uh, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, but but there is a place for it. Uh, mm -hmm. There is absolutely a place for being careful. Funny story that when you it came to my mind when you mentioned uh, the beginning of that that answer when you talked about the babies. Um, as a new mom to my first child, um, at a baby shower, someone had purchased for uh, my family a bottle sanitizer. And, uh, you know, being the scientist that I am, I read mm -hmm. the instructions <laughs> and I read all of the ways to use it. Um, and then uh, when my daughter was born, I went to our pediatrician because I was really I really sure. wanted to understand how this worked. And I went to her and I said, you know, I have this bottle sanitizer um, where you sanitize the nipples to the bottle. But if I take it out of the bottle sanitizer, then it's no longer sanitized. So how do I keep it sanitized <laughs> for my daughter <laughs> and the pediatrician? And she was like, who are you? <laughs> she looked at me and she said, that is such a first mom question. <laughs> yeah. She said, you know, by the time it's over, you're going to drop something on the ground and spit on yep. it and put it right back yep. in her mouth. <laughs> right. So real world, right? I mean, I totally agree with you, Stephanie. And, and congratulations on being a new mom. I, my two children, uh, both college educated, done, we're empty nesting. But but you can imagine my wife putting up with me yeah. uh, when, when our newborns came along. So I, I totally get it. Um, I often will tell people, um, you know, one child uh, very easily would breastfeed, the other would not, from my experience. And the one that didn't, you know, we kind of went through that and it was the first one. So it was the first child. Um, we would do things like at least put them through the dishwasher, which is really close to sterilization. It's not perfect. And, you know, and the pediatrician would say the same things. You know, in general, mm -hmm. it, it's going to be okay. And, and your child is going to be exposed. You can't put them in a bubble. Right. But you also don't let them, mm -hmm. right, eat out of the dog. in the face by a dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because, I mean, again, when people talk to me about this, uh, I actually talk to them about, look, I'm an animal I worked in animal infectious diseases for a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though rabies is always on my radar, it's all the other stuff that's that's dangerous, uh, especially like a dog nick or a scratch or something like that, yeah. because animals have a whole world of dangerous flora that they're used to, including frogs and reptiles and things like that, that you have to be careful with. So if you get bitten, especially it's the rabies isn't my first worry. It's it's weird bacterial pathogens or pastorella from kitty cats or things like that that can be a problem, especially for infants and, and others. Mm -hmm. 
Now, you, if you have not been inspired to go wash your hands and wipe down your car steering <laughs> wheel and sanitize your cell phone, then we have not done our job. But as we wrap this up, um, common sense. Right? What's a final piece of advice or tip that you can leave for our listeners? And then also, how could our listeners uh, continue to reach out to you if they have any questions? Sure. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, well, so many, so many things I like to think about over my career that I like to share. First of all, let me let me mention that um, I've done quite a few articles. Uh, the last few years of my of my world have been uh, what I call explainer articles in science communication, helping the lay public to understand things from from COVID to antibiotic resistance to obtaining your Ph.D. To uh, tips from a father and a professor to get through college, mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are things I'm passionate about. So if you if you look for those things or Google my name, sometimes you'll see them pop up. Um, so I have lots, uh, you know, things to kind of mention here. But just from the standpoint of my profession, my professional side, you know, I think every student, if you're a student or even a new professional or even a seasoned veteran. I should always explore the opportunities of networking, 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 um, and finding your passion. Uh, because as you know, Stephanie, and Stephanie's one of my newest friends and colleagues, uh, you, you can enrich your life um, professionally and personally in that manner in a way that you probably never dreamed. And so when you're sitting in that room or that conference or um, church or wherever you're at, uh, try to find a way to network because uh, diversifying your your portfolio of friends and mentors can absolutely launch your career uh, in a way that you never expected. I doubt Stephanie thought she would be hosting podcast. I did not. <laughs> and I never dreamed I would be doing what I was doing. Uh, it, it my life is a and still is a journey of. I don't know, amazing points. And when I look backwards, I can absolutely identify where I took a step into kind of a scary unknown situation. Coming into academia was a scary thing. Um, you know, writing a, a publication or doing a podcast. These are things that a lot of people aren't comfortable with, but my goodness, they've changed my life. And so I would just say to, to dare to dream and to explore those areas for yourself and, and you can really take off. As far as connecting with me, um, and Stephanie knows this, I'm actively on Twitter mm -hmm. at Rodney Rohde. So that's R-O-D-N-E-Y-R-O-H-D-E. I also utilize LinkedIn. I find it a very wonderful professional networking tool. And I'm on Facebook. Those are my three biggies. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel. If you're interested with oh, about the last six or seven years of my career with different uh, video and audio interviews and things like that, trying to grow that. And I have a, a pretty intense website uh, here at Texas State. It's hosted by Texas State, but it's really a personal and professional website. The biggest thing for me, and, I, and people know this about me, will laugh at me, but my last name gets messed up a lot. Yeah. So it's R O H D E, pronounced Rody, mm -hmm. uh, because that can get messed up sometimes. So those are my primary uh, tools and alongside the other ways you can find me through professional organizations and so forth. I'm pretty open uh, to sharing my emails and things like that. So look me up. Well, I will say the first time that we uh, shared a platform together, I, I told Dr. Rohde that hearing him talk made me want to go pipette something. You know, it just made me want to go out and be a better laboratory professional. So that is the sign of a great speaker, of a great advocate, of a great mentor. And thank you for joining me on this episode today. Thank you, Stephanie. And I will flip it right back on you. Uh, individuals that, that continue to communicate like you have, uh, like Lona, like Tawana, like so many others that we have come across are amazing and helpful. And I so appreciate journalism and other things in my life that I never thought I'd be interacting with. So thank you. No problem. And thank you to our listening audience for tuning in to today's show with our special guest, Dr. Rodney Rohde, sharing some essential information about antimicrobial resistance and what we can all do as laboratory professionals or just humans to help impact change. Be sure to check out some of his previous talks 
articles and other bodies of work. I'll put those in the show notes. If you like what you heard today and you want to listen to our previous episodes, please please subscribe to our show at directimpactbroadcasting.com or on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to share this episode with one of your laboratory colleagues. You can follow me on all social media at Stephanie Y. Whitehead. And until next time or until the next week, uh, have a great evening. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elaborate Topics, where your hosts discussed relevant strategies for laboratory professionals. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us on directimpactbroadcasting.com. Stay tuned for another episode with information you can use to excel in your laboratory career.